Okay, let's have a word of prayer. I'm going to do a sort of, a, I'm doing the prophecy talk tonight, but there will be a bit of a prophecy talk this morning, so let's just have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you we can come together in the name of Jesus, pray you bless and guide the teaching now as I give it, and we pray for your help, and we pray that you help us to understand these things and to know your will. We thank you, Lord, for Jesus, thank you that you've given us your word, and that your word is truth, and your word guides us into all truth. So guide us, Lord, as we look at your word and the current situation in the world, in the name of Jesus. Amen. <clears throat> so our beloved leader, Boris Johnson, told us this week that the world is at one minute to midnight as a deal on climate change hangs in the balance. If we don't get serious about climate change, it'll be too late for our children to do so tomorrow. If Glasgow fails, the whole thing fails. So David Attenborough said the human story could come to an end on Earth unless immediate action is taken to tackle climate change. So are we on the way to the end? Will the end of civilization come because of climate change? Or actually will the climate change agenda itself be part of the one world government system which could bring us to the end? Um, New Heart magazine just come out, we got it here. Um, asks, how long have we got to go? Quite a good edition, this one. It says, how long have we got till the lights go out, until there's another lockdown, till there are food shortages, until the fuel runs out, till vaccine deaths are reported along with COVID deaths, till the nation turns to God in desperation, until Jesus returns? Good question. How long have we got? Well, I don't know because he doesn't really don't know the day or the hour. But he did say when there are certain things happening in the world, then these are signs. When these things begin to happen, you should look up and lift up your heads because you know that your redemption is drawing near. Probably the longest passage where Jesus speaks about his return is in Matthew 24. And I'm going to read a few verses from Matthew 24, not to go into it in great detail, but just to bring out one or two major things which Jesus says concerning his coming, Matthew 24. First of all, where did it take place? On the Mount of Olives. Mount of Olives, significant place where Jesus ascended into heaven and where he's going to come back to, according to Zechariah chapter 14. As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately and said, Tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? If you have an authorized version, it'll say the end of the world. The Greek word is aeon. Is it the end of the world or the end of the age? I believe actually it's the end of the age because there's going to be a time after Jesus returns in which he's going to reign on the earth for a thousand years in the time we call the millennial kingdom, which there'll be peace and justice and the world will be put to rights, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, authorized version says it's the end of the world. I think Aeon better translated as age and there will be a time after Jesus returns. But he says that the disciples recognize that the, Jesus said that he will come back. What will be the sign of your coming? They were looking for a second coming of Jesus Christ. A lot of the church has kind of deleted that from the agenda, but whether the church has deleted it or not, it's going to happen. Because Jesus answered and he said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, I am the Messiah, you will deceive many. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that you are not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Uh, those signs, general signs of the coming of false messiahs, wars and troubles, Jesus says are going to happen, they're not in themselves actually the sign of the end. He says the end is not yet. These are things that are going to happen in the time between the first and the second coming of Jesus. So don't be surprised if after Jesus ascends to heaven, you're going to see wars and troubles, you're going to see false messiahs coming and leading people astray. Has that happened in the time between the first and second coming of Jesus? Yeah. And it's going to continue and get more intense as you get nearer to the second coming of Jesus. Jesus then goes on to say, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows of sorrows important phrase there he's saying that when you see these specific things happening then you know actually that the countdown to the end times has begun so when you see an increase of wars uh, of nation against nation kingdom against kingdom famines pestilences earthquakes in various places see those things happening see them increasing as you see those things increasing, these are the signs of the beginning of sorrows. The beginning of sorrows means the beginning of the labor pains which are going to lead up to the second coming of Jesus. 
How long those labor pains would go on, he doesn't tell us. So they could begin uh, and come very rapidly, or it could be extended. So we can't actually tell the date, but we can see that when you see these things begin to happen, that process is going to be set in motion, which will lead to the second coming of Jesus. <clears throat> he then goes on to describe some of the more intense aspects of this, persecution of Christians, false prophets coming, evil going out into the world, also the gospel being preached to the ends of the earth. And then in the verses from, chapter, from verse, uh, verse uh, <clears throat> 15 onwards, he speaks very specifically about the time which we call the Great Tribulation, uh, referring to Daniel the prophet and the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. I won't go into detail of what that means, but he says when you see that beginning to happen, that is one of the signs that you're now in the last time, the last of the last times, which we call the Great Tribulation. Uh, verse 21, Jesus says concerning this, then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Uh, a number of passages in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Daniel, and other passages speak about, almost use the same words, about a time of intense trouble, unlike any that has been before or ever shall be again. Uh, Jesus says quite specifically here that if God didn't cut short those days, those days of intense trouble, no flesh would be saved. It's interesting, he says no flesh would be saved, not no soul would be saved. Uh, you could be killed in some war or have a nu nuclear bomb dropped on you, and if you're a believing Christian, your soul will be saved. Uh, if you are a believing Christian, there wouldn't be much left of your flesh. Your flesh would go. And Jesus says here that specifically, you know, flesh would be saved, implying to me that if God didn't cut short this process of the intense time of trouble, then it would be the end of life on earth. Uh, so there is that possibility then. He does say that God will cut it short, so it's not going to be the end of life on earth, because I say there's going to be another thousand years in which a glorious time in which Jesus is going to reign and bring peace and justice to the world. But that is a possibility coming out of this time. Finally, in verse uh, 29, he says, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. He will send his angels with a great sound of the trumpet. They will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Uh, Harry says something very specific, that after the end of the tribulation period, uh, there will be a visible sign, which will be the sun, the sun going dark, the moon not giving its light, and something happened to affect the light from the stars and the heavens. Uh, therefore, there will be a darkness on the earth, and when that darkness happens, suddenly there will be the sign of the Son of Man appearing in heaven. It doesn't tell us what the sign of the Son of Man is, but if we look at other scriptures, you could deduce that the sign of the Son of Man is actually the Shekinah, the glory of God, with the piercing light of the glory of God coming and appearing in the heavens, and then the Son of Man coming in the, on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Uh, so Jesus says he's going to come this time on the clouds of heaven, which means the glory of God, with power and great glory. So he's coming now to the earth uh, with power and great glory uh, to judge the world in righteousness. He says he's going to send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, one end of heaven to the other. Raises the question, is that the rapture of the church or is it the gathering together of the elect, those who have been saved during the tribulation period and the elect of Israel? A question which theologians discuss. Uh, I believe it's not actually the rapture of the church, but it, he speaks there will be a gathering which will gather people together uh, and then he will return to the earth. And when he comes back, he's not coming back on his own, he's coming back with the saints those who have previously died in faith, those who have been caught up to meet him in the rapture of the church, and will be part of that time when he's going to reign on the earth. Praise God. Then he says, Now learn from this parable from the fig tree, when its branches become tender and puts forth leaves, you know that its summer is near. So you also, when you see these things, know that it is near at the door. Surely I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away till all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will by no means pass away. Assuring us that uh, his word is going to continue right until the end of days. And he gives us this parable of the fig tree. 
Um, now, there are two possible interpretations of the fig tree. One is that the fig tree putting forth its leaves represents all of the prophecies taking, taking place. So when you see them all happening, then you know that Jesus is coming. And we see, uh, it says this is going to be the sign of the second coming of Jesus. When you see all these things taking place, that he's spoken of, taking place, then that is a sign of Jesus returning. The other interpretation is that the fig tree represents the restoration of Israel, the national life of Israel, because in the Old Testament, in the book of Jeremiah, in the book of Hosea, the use of the fig tree is used as a symbol of the national life of Israel. Jesus cursed the fig tree and the, na and the fig tree withered, seen as a picture of the withering of the national life of Israel after his first coming, after the dispersion of the Jewish people following the events of AD 70. So when you see that withering and the scattering of the Jewish people, then you see them gathering together uh, to the land of Israel, particularly to Jerusalem, then that is a sign that you're living in the last days. And I believe that that is a sign to those who are living in the last days that Jesus spoke of, the scattering, the regathering of Israel uh, to the land of Israel, and specifically the events of 1948, mm -hmm. restoration of Israel, and 1967, the return of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, which will become the burdensome stone, burdening all nations, as Zechariah says, a source of conflict which will lead to the last battle, battle over Jerusalem. So these are things which actually refer, refer to our generation. Uh, then in verse 6 he says, but th that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my father only. As the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. As in the days of Noah, before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, till the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field, one will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill, one will be taken and the other left. Watch therefore, for you do not know what hour your Lord is coming. But know this, that if the master of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would, not, he would have watched and not allowed his house to be broken into. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Speaks of the days of Noah, the days before the flood, days when there was great wickedness on the earth. Noah preached uh, to that generation and constructed the ark, which would be the one place which people could go into to be saved when the flood came, parallel with our salvation in Jesus. Time we live in of great wickedness on the earth. God has made an ark of salvation for those who repent and believe the gospel through which we'll be saved if we enter in through faith in Jesus. Um, the flood came suddenly, and people were going about their normal business, eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, uh, giving, going about their normal business, and suddenly the flood came, and that was the end of them, to be honest. <laughs> and uh, Jesus says that this will be the same at, on this event. People are going about their normal business, going about life as normal, and then suddenly one will be taken and one will be left. I do believe that this is actually a picture of the rapture. Uh, some people disagree. It says the Greek word for being taken is paralambio, which means to be taken alongside you in a friendly way. Uh, the Greek word for left behind is afiemu, afi which means to be left behind in an unfriendly way. So those who are taken, I believe here, are the saints who are taken at an unknown date. And he says here, therefore be ready because the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So it's coming suddenly, unexpectedly, with no signs given beforehand. Remember in verse 31, he said that he's going to come after the tribulation of those days, after the darkness, after all of that happens, then he will come to the earth. So actually this doesn't really add up with that, because then it would not be unexpected. In fact, in Revelation 6, it says when the uh, darkness comes and when the things ha start happening, even the wicked say to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the wrath of the Lamb. They recognize that this is the sign of the second coming of Jesus. So this could happen at any time, in which case you'd be ready for Jesus to come now. So just to sum up, you've got a sequence of events, wars, famines, pestilences, followed by a time of tribulation, followed by the coming of Jesus to the earth, and an exhortation here to be ready for an event which could happen at any time. Uh, so one level, be ready for times of trouble, times of suffering, also be ready to be with the Lord, to meet with him at any time. 
As I said, I believe that the time we're living in now is very much summed up in verses 7 to 8, where he says, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Happening now. And these things are going to increase as we get nearer to the second coming of Jesus. Uh, in Luke 21, he spoke about the distress of nations with perplexity, men's hearts fading them from fear for what's coming on the earth. The distress of nations with perplexity is a Greek phrase with perplexity, which means aporia, which means with no way out. So there's going to be a crisis coming on the earth, which is going to cause people to be afraid of what's coming because they can't see a solution to it, no way out of it. See that happening now. Also, the scriptures imply that at this time there's going to be a very strong movement in the wrong direction as people accept the Antichrist spirit, which is going to be going out into the world, which is going to cause people to reject the truth and to accept the lie. A number of prophecies in the Bible speak about this taking place. Jeremiah chapter 25, he says, Behold, evil, or could be translated disaster, shall go forth from nation to nation, and a great tempest is stirring from the ends of the earth. So when you see trouble, nations, evil going forth from nation to nation, uh, then this is a sign of the last days. Going to be a wrong spirit in the world. Uh, people will be taking the wrong approach and rejecting God and accepting the evil spirit. Verse 2 Timothy chapter 3. Mark, this will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying its power. Do you see that kind of spirit at work in the world today? I think I do. <laughs> And these are things which are going to be happening. In, specifically, he says, in the last days, you're going to see an increase of this kind of behavior, of people going in the exact opposite way from which God tells us to go in the Bible. 1 John 2, he says, little children, it's the last hour, as you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come, come by which we know it is the last hour. Who is a lie but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ or the Messiah? He's Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So you're going to see a lot of Antichrist, a lot of the spirit of Antichrist going out, leading to the Antichrist, the final figure who will come, according to Revelation 13, as the one empowered by Satan to take control of the nations in the very last of the last days. So when you see a lot of antichrist spirit going out, whether it's communism, Islam, uh, New Age, occultism, uh, liberal theology, denying the divinity of Jesus, and you see this spirit going out and controlling the thoughts of people around the world, another sign of the last days that's leading to the second coming of Jesus.